All right, so continuing on with the destructive uh, pneumonia phenomenon, just to give you a differential on this, this one, there is clearly a, a focus of consolidation with a central early cavitation. You can see a cavity is beginning to form there. Certainly this could be destructive pneumonia, but don't forget your differential on airspace density, right? Which I'm sure everyone knows it could be pus, it could be blood, it could be fluid, it could be cells, right? And in this case, that's actually blood. So this is a case of Wegener's granulomatosis, or I've been forced to change my terminology there, uh, granulomatosis with angiitis. By the way, I have some old terminology in here. You are welcome to correct me if the name has changed on something and I don't mention it. Sometimes I'm just a recalcitrant curmudgeon and I use the old terminology uh, just to be difficult, but I'm trying to update them uh, where a new term has really come into common usage. All right, so that one I managed it, granulomatosis with angiitis. And again, that airspace density you're looking at there is blood. So I used to always think, oh, I can tell them all apart. Uh, I'm better than all these guys that say it could be anything. Not true. Uh, it, it could be anything. Consolidation. All right, this is a fascinating case. This is a phenomenon called vanishing lung, and it's kind of the extreme of this cystic lung destruction theme we're on. It really brings home the fact that COPD is an inflammatory condition, right? All that soot and ash and uh, all the various stuff that gets deposited in smokers' lungs elicits a serious inflammatory reaction. That's why COPD can actually continue to progress even after people have stopped smoking. But this is obviously a very extreme case. This actually happens in younger smokers. And look at that, there is no lung parenchyma in that upper lobe region, and not a whole lot in the lower lobe. These are really extreme. I remember this patient's pulmonologist told me that this patient did in fact quit smoking because he was too short of breath to smoke. <laughs> so. I found that pretty believable looking at the of the description here. Pretty incredible. Vanishing <laughs> lung. All right. All right, this is one of my favorite cases ever. And we're going down into the pelvis here to begin with. There is a fluid collection. I want everybody paying attention here. This is one of my favorite findings. There is a fluid collection sitting right there deep to the iliacus muscle, right on the anterior aspect of the sacroiliac joint, just anterior to it and extending out laterally from it, creeping along on the deep aspect of the iliacus right against the ilium. That is the classic location for fluid collections to essentially decompress when they're originating from the sacroiliac joint. Okay, so this is infectious sacroiliitis. And I didn't even bother to save the bone windows for this case because they were entirely normal. So when you see that fluid collection, this is one of those that uh, I've shown this case a few times over the years. And every few years I get an email from one of the BRAD radiologists saying, hey, I just saw this, thanks. Right, just carry it with you always. That is a great way you can make the early diagnosis of infectious sacroiliitis, even in the presence of normal bone windows. The other finding here is there is actually a filling defect in the posterior iliac vein, right at the bifurcation of the common iliac vein. And there it is. You can just see that filling defect, that rounded thing in the posterior aspect of the common iliac vein and it's bifurcating right at that point. So what you have is infectious sacroiliitis with infectious or septic thrombophlebitis of the posterior iliac vein. This also extends out the inferior and posterior aspect of the sacroiliac joint and you'll see these go into the greater sciatic notch. So there's a fluid collection extending out here into the external rotators, 
right, which represents another decompression of a septic sacroiliac joint. And then lastly, because we have septic thrombophlebitis, now we're back to the pulmonary theme, right? We have these peripheral subpleural cavitations that are the classic finding of septic emboli. So when you see bilateral cavities that are up against fissures, up against pleural surfaces, definitely start thinking septic embolization. They're not all going to be peripheral. Uh, that is not an absolute rule, but I like to see at least one or two of them uh, pretty notably peripheral before I uh, really come down hard on it. This one was funny because this went in the reverse order. Usually you would diagnose the cavitary lesions first and then go looking for the source. And in this case, I had the pelvis first and said, this person's got septic thrombophlebitis and we should scan her chest. And uh, I got a lot of pushback from people saying the bone windows were normal and we don't see the point. And they finally scanned her chest and found uh, extensive septic emboli. So note again, see that fluid collection under the iliacus extending from the anterior aspect of the right SI joint. And that uh, filling defect in the posterior division of the, common il of the iliac vein. We'll look at that one more time because this case is so cool. There you see that filling defect. And it runs through several, several slices. All right, and here is the whole chest. You can see again, many of these are peripheral, not all of them, but many of them are. So multiple bilateral subpleural cavities, septic embolization. Nice fluid level in that one big one, too, which should draw your eye. Right, that suggests this is going to be infectious. All right. A few more cystic things, a nice thick-walled cyst here. Certainly, uh, tuberculosis is on your differential. Also, Poxy, also Wegner's. And of course, don't forget that metastatic disease uh, can cavitate. But this one is associated with another kind of classic pulmonary finding called tree in bud. So you get these little dot-like things. These actually correspond to respiratory units, right? Respiratory bronchioles and a small collection of alveoli. And so these actually, they look like, it looks like a cherry blossom, doesn't it? This, unfortunately, nonspecific as well. Uh, you can see it with tuberculosis, other uh, fungal or granulomatous infections, and even some tumors. There are reports of lymphoma presenting initially as tree and bud. So, unfortunately, not specific, but when you see a cavity and tree and bud, as in this case, I think tuberculosis is pretty high on your list. So, there's the cavity and the tree and bud. And a little more tree and bud there in the right middle lobe. Right? And of course, a very helpful thing is to find calcifications in the mediastinum, which really suggests tuberculosis. I came from uh, Arizona, so in Tucson we saw tons of coxy, and the bottom line with that is coxy does not cause calcified lymph nodes. So you see a cavity with tree and bud, it could be TB or coxy, go look at the mediastinum, because if the mediastinum has calcifications, TB is the far better choice over coxy. So you can see there are a number of mediastinal and hyalur calcifications that tips you to tuberculosis here. All right, another tuberculosis. This is the classic uh, Lady Windermere finding, right? This is right middle lobe and lingular bronchiectasis and bronchiectasis in this distribution, especially an elderly female, should immediately call to mind MAI. And so that is Mycobacterium avium intracellulare. It's a, often a chronic colonization. And so these patients are not horrifically sick. Again, it's usually elderly females, oftentimes institutionalized. 
Uh, this MAI, by the way, I always, when I hear of it, I always think, see how there are all these other nodules that are throughout the lungs. And don't forget, TB is a classic cooler on PET scan. It'll be very hot. And I will always remember I had an MAI case of a woman with a bunch of upper lobe nodules. It did not have the classic bronchiectasis, but her SUVs were 12 on those nodules. And I said, oh, a horror of horrors, this has got to be tumor. And of course it wasn't. So uh, I remember being asked one time by a bunch of oncologists, well, what's the number where you know definitively and beyond the shadow of a doubt that that thing must be a tumor? Sadly, there isn't one because these foolers don't cause uh, elevated SUVs to a lesser extent, they can just look exactly like tumors. So again, that is the uh, Lady Windermere finding a uh, chronic MAI. All right, this is one you don't see too often, but that everybody knows, right? So extensive destruction, this is a tuberculosis patient. It, of course, loves the upper lobes and chronically can cause this extent of uh, essentially cystic lung destruction. But then there is this hyperdense ball uh, in the dependent aspect of this cavity, and that is a classic mycetoma. People mess around with these. In the old days, you'd uh, do prone positioning and see that it moved. That was considered uh, critical for the diagnosis. I don't know that people monkey around uh, to that extent anymore. This is uh, a nice one, too, though, showing all the other cystic changes, bronchiectasis, and even some airspace disease. So that is typically going to be actinomyces, is the fungus that causes that mycetoma. But uh, I'm sure there are a number of other things that have been described. All right. Last TB case, I believe. This one is miliary tuberculosis. This is millet seed nodules. They are so tiny that you often can't even see the individual nodules. Uh, you get a sense that it's nodular when you really mag it up, but it, it almost uh, looks like just fuzzy interstitium to me when I look at this. This one always scares me. And again, this is a, a situation where looking to the edge can be very helpful, where you'll suddenly appreciate, hey, this is actually micronodularity. The thing that can be a real fooler with these as well is the fact that these patients are often not overwhelmingly clinically ill. In fact, you get to this point of having miliary spread of tuberculosis by being severely immunocompromised. So sometimes in spite of the extent of involvement here, a patient like this can be febrile and can fail to respond to skin testing and other uh, diagnostics that are dependent on an immune response. So in this one as well has uh, that telltale Hyler calcification that's so helpful. Do always, when you're looking at nodular lung disease, do always keep in mind metastatic disease. Uh, I have seen cases of micronodularity from pulmonary mets as well. Melanoma and thyroid are the examples that come to mind. And of course, breast can go anywhere and look like anything. So do always keep it in mind. But I think high on your differential here is going to be miliary tuberculosis. Again, you've got the hyalur calcification there to help you with that. And they're fairly extensive. All right, so that is miliary tuberculosis. All right, this is a modern entity. This one is all alveolar. So this isn't actually nodules in the interstitium like the previous one. This is actually down at the level of respiratory bronchioles, right? Respiratory units, where these are little foci of fluid-filled alveoli that you're looking at. And it is spread throughout both lungs pretty widely with some pleural sparing. And this is the, you can see again, see the fissures, that black line you see move through as you scroll down. So alveolar, pleural sparing, 
but not necessarily central in the lung lobes like congestive heart failure and not associated with interlobular septal thickening, which you might expect with CHF, right? And the lung bases are relatively uninvolved. Inhalational diseases do tend to go uh, to the higher portions, the upper lobes, the superior segments of the lower lobes, uh, just because of the way air distributes when you inhale. So yeah, you can, this one really is pretty definitive. This is, uh, as I saw one presenter say, just ask what's this person been smoking? Uh, certainly hypersensitivity uh, pneumonitis can start like this as well, but then ultimately gets into more air trapping and interstitial change as well. So that's something that's on your differential list, but this is pretty good for just vape lung. 